all the way from the North Pole, Santa Claus, would you come on out? <laughs> yeah! Ho, 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 ho. Howdy. How you doing? Hey, Rudy. Oh, oh, no, no, no. Bring Rudolph over here. We want to see what's going oh, on here. got to say, people make me a bit nervous now. <laughs> you be all right, boy? I think he lost all his nose right. already. He can do it. He was all right. Wow. So you rode him from the North Pole all the way down here, huh? Well, I actually, Pastor, I got to tell you, I, uh, during my off season, I try to take a bit of a, a vacation, so to speak. And uh, this year, I've been hanging out at Dude Ranch. Sounds like somewhere Learned in the that. South, somewhere you've kind oh, of picked up I an accent. Oh, I can't reveal exactly where I, where I like to spend my time. I, uh, fans, paparazzi. Okay. Uh, I understand. Wow. Um, Santa, uh, I know we still have a few months, but you got to be chowing down a little bit more, don't you? Well, actually, that's, that's another thing I wanted to mention today. Uh, most of the pictures are taken of me after the Christmas season. Christmas, you know, it's, they always get me on my, uh, my worst days, so ah, to speak. Okay. Well, Santa, we've been dealing with a subject around belief, and of course, you know a lot of people believe in you. Oh, yes, I do. All right. And that you have certain rules. Yeah, yeah, I guess you can call them rules or uh, well, behaviors. Let's, behaviors. Let's talk about this list that we've grown up hearing about. The being on the naughty list? How's that work? No, it's, it's pretty simple, I guess you could say. Uh, it's not as, as black and white as, as most people would like it. I can't tell you most particular actions. I can't give you a list and say, hey, you know, this is what's going to put you over here on the naughty list. This is what's going to put you on the nice list. It's about the heart. It's about the heart. Selfishness and hatred, those will get you on the naughty list in a flash. Wow. Repentance and, you know, being, being genuinely sorry and, and aware of your actions will get you off it. But you don't, um, hearing this, and knowing the other things about you, on one night, you can be everywhere, it seems like. And Pretty close to it. And you're, you put people on a naughty list based on their heart things and stuff like that. You sound a lot like someone that we've come to talk about here in these weeks. You sound like God. Oh, no, sir. <laughs> Don't put me up there. <laughs> okay. All right. No, no, no. But, yeah, me and him talk a lot, though. But you're, you, <laughs> that's good to know. But you are up there. You, you really do live the North Pole. Oh, well, yeah, like I said, off and on. It, it gets a bit chilly. You know, after, right. after those milk and cookies go down, it's, it's a, yeah. All right, yeah. so how does it make you feel when you learn that people stop believing in you? Yeah, I've got to say, honestly, uh, it, it does hurt my feelings a little bit, only because uh, you know, I work hard. I work hard for, for, for all of these folks. You know, and uh, it's not it's not a one day a year thing. Like you said, yeah, on, on Christmas I do have to be in multiple places at, at one time. But uh, you know, I'm, I'm working throughout the whole year, and uh, I'm, I'm watching. I got a good team behind me. Don't oh. get me wrong, but yeah, it uh, ungrateful is almost what it seems. Hmm. Well, uh, Santa, I, a couple things first. <clears throat> Thank you coming to the Ark today. What a cool thing! And, and I never knew that if you spend certain times in certain areas, you could actually sound like a southerner there. Well, you do, you do, man, I'm telling you. It's, uh, it's uh, you know, you go spend some time in, say, France. You know, you're gonna come back talking a bit weird, <laughs> or, or, or French, uh, w w whichever. <laughs> I only know French fries, that's all the well, part yeah, that. Well, yeah, those are pretty okay. good, too. Yeah, yeah okay. Helps add the pounds. All right, well, Santa, you've helped us today. The things that you just shared with us make all the difference as we're looking at the subject of somebody you talk to a lot, God. And so thank you for coming all the way. Where did you come from since you didn't come from the North Pole? Uh, <laughs> naughty list. You're naughty naughty list. list, okay. Right there, ah. hey, I, I just have one thing to say. I, I, was, talking to, I was talking to my good buddy, the, the Tooth Fairy. Huh? Uh, he said he came by last week and uh, something was malfunctioning. I don't know, cameras or, or something. We, we got all that worked out for... Uh, for the big guy, didn't we? I hope so, or they could be on the naughty list. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we'll see about that one. We'll see yeah. about that one. But hey, on that line, are you kind of related to the Tooth Fairy? Nope. No relation, okay. All right. All right. All right.
Well, thank Santa Claus for being here today. Thank you, Santa. Now, believe it or not, they still have another friend, and there's the rumor that he will be here next week. So if you want to know what the Easter Bunny knows, you don't want to miss next week. We're talking about the tri-God, the triune God. The, Romans says this invisible God, but divine nature is known, and there's no excuse that you could see him in creation himself. And we've looked at certain things, like the atom. Now that we live in a scientific age and they've been able to take the atom apart and we see that there's the nucleus, there's the electrons and the protons. Interesting, three elements in this thing called an atom. We look at fruit, and many of the fruits you have the skin, you have the meat, or you have then the seeds, or if it's not seeds, the juice of the fruit. And so we see that this trinity aspect is tucked away in different parts of nature. We talked about water, H2O. There is that essence, that element, yet it can be in a liquid form that replenishes you, it can be in an ice form that preserves things, and it can be in a steam form that brings power. Steam engine power, remember those days? Some of you just were around when that got created, right? <laughs> All right. So today, we want to talk about what was up there. What can be, what can remove you from the naughty list, from the naughty list. Because as we see what God says in his word, we see that all mankind, that's everybody, has been born in a sin state. Now, probably naughty is too easy of a word. The reality is we're in a lost list. Lost. Wouldn't you like to be on the list that says, I understand what life was supposed to be all about? We actually call that list the book of life. Now, to me, naughty list is kind of nice. It fits for Santa Claus. But for biblical terms here, there was a serious issue, a separation between the God that just we talked about here that reveals himself and his creation. And something had to be done. So God gave the solution. We find that solution in 1 Peter. In 1 Peter, we actually find when did the solution to this problem come to pass? You saw the problem last week that what happened was that in the garden, Adam and Eve decided that they would believe a serpent and go on their own will choice instead of trusting in a defined relationship with God. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, the background of this of this scripture is actually tells you the whole details of that God had a plan to fix the problem of sin for his creation, you and I. That he knew that there had to be a price to be paid for the sins of mankind. And who pays the price? Not you, not me, but God himself. He sends a part of himself. He's known as the Son of God. Now pick it up in verse 20. Verse 19 told you that it was Christ and the lamb that was without blemish that he shed his blood. That's the atonement. That's the offering. He's the one that took my place and your place. But look at what verse 20 gives us a clue when they decided on this. He was chosen before the creation of the world but was revealed in the last times for your sake. Through him, you believe in God. Through who? Through the Son of God, you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, so your faith and hope are in God. Here's one of the things I got. Here's a statement I, I wanted you to, to write this down. An all-knowing God. This is who he is. An all-knowing God. An all-powerful God. Plan the solution before the problem. Isn't that interesting? He planned the solution. See, since he's all-knowing, he knew when he created mankind, and last week we talked about the rules to find the relationship, in the garden, there was only one rule. Isn't it amazing? If you're given one rule, you break that one rule. And
And Adam and Eve represented all of us created in God's likeness with a free will, one rule, and they broke the one rule. But remember, the rule wasn't the condition for a relationship. The rule was there to confirm there's a relationship, not a condition for the relationship. So God, before his creation, was going to break the rule that says, you are identifying with me. They broke the identification. Do you see what happened in the garden? What was sin? What was their choice? They broke their identification. Instead of talking to God and saying, you know, this uh, serpent over here has been saying some things to us, and we'd like to talk to you about that. He says, you're keeping that tree because we'd be more like you if we ate of it. But you said if we eat of it, we'll die. Who's telling truth? And isn't that really the issue when we're talking about our relationship with God? Who's telling the truth? And in this world especially, because... A lot of people are wondering, does truth exist? Well, I want you to know, truth has always existed. It was the lie that was invented. Isn't that good? So in this verse here, we see that before the problem actually came to be, the Trinity, the triune God, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit said, we will have a solution. And God the Son said, I will be the sacrificial lamb for the world. I love that, don't you? The second thing out of this passage I want you to get. The Son of God came into the world so that we could be saved? No. Look what I put. The Son of God came in this world according to this passage. Through him you believe in God. The Son of God came in this world so that you could know God. Now write this word down, know. K-N-O-W. It is a different word than what we get in our American English. In the Hebrew and in the Greek, this word means something much more than, oh, I know these people. I know them. It is actually the same word that we use for an intimacy within marriage, a oneness. Now, we only use that with, between a husband and wife, that they become one. And that word to know is the same one when it says Adam knew Eve, and now there is Cain and Abel. It was the intimacy of knowing that created their children. He uses the same word that he came so that you could believe and that you could know God. Know God in this deep intimacy of knowing. I think that's pretty powerful, don't you? To know God like you would not know anybody else. It's reserved for this relationship that it's such an intimate relationship that you know that he knows your heart. If he's an all-knowing God, is there anything in your heart that you could hide from him? He knows your mind. Is there anything that, any thought that you could tuck away and go, well, he doesn't know I think those things? Yes, he does. The devil doesn't because the devil's not all-knowing. But God is. This is the things that we're learning about God. And within this, that's why I picked this one characteristic, his kindness. Why would I pick that? Well, in the prophets, Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24, He gives us some insight into this relationship with our God, and it's actually with what is the key of the relationship that says your relationship now has moved to the level that God has desired. Listen to how it reads in Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. Listen who's speaking. This is what the Lord says. Who's speaking? This is the Lord saying, Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom, or the strong man boast of his strength, or the rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts boast about this. Now, very interesting. You're allowed to boast, but about this, that he understands, and here's that word, and knows me. It's not... You have information about God. You've heard about him. You've read even some things in the Bible about him, but that you know 
him in this intimate way. Now watch what he says you can know about him that makes it very intimate. That I am the Lord. <gasps> he is the Lord. There's his role in our life. Now watch what he wants you to know right after that. Who exercises kindness. You see why I put try God today and it's his kindness? Out of all the things that God says, I want them to know this about me. I want them to know, yes, I am the Lord. There's nobody else. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. There's only one. Serve him with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. But out of all those things, here's what I want you to know. I exercise kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. Hmm. If you wanted someone to know one thing about you, what would that one thing be? How interesting that our God, the creator of everything, the all-knowing, all-powerful, the all-present, he's everywhere. Santa Claus really can't be everywhere, can he? Santa Claus, we've, we've made these myths and things because we see that, that there was a need for people to believe to care about one another, to be a gift giver. And the greatest gift and the greatest story is not a fictional story. It's not a fairy tale. The God of the universe wants you to know that he can be kind. So I ask this question. What do you know and understand about God? What do you know and understand about God? Immediately, you know what I think? Uh, here's, here's what I went. Well, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, I got some reasons why I don't know everything about God. I mean, you know, I have some excuses. Now, remember Romans 120 said, no, 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 you're without excuse. And I thought, okay, he only said it once. And so if I didn't get all the nature stuff, it, it, there's really got to be some other excuses why I wouldn't know in a very intimate way, this God who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness. Do you know what justice really is? You know it in the world when you go, oh, in this court hearing, justice was served. Truth prevailed. In the courtroom, you, justice was served because truth was found out. And he's the one that exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness. Justice is truth prevailing. Righteousness is being in a proper relationship, a right standing before God. But I want to focus on the very first one that he picked, kindness, for us this morning. You can see that we could be many, many weeks if we wanted to just talking about knowing and understanding God. And so, but in your mind you're going, I don't know who I really do know. You only get to see what they reveal of themselves. Isn't that true? You know your friends at work because they act like they do at work. But then when you see them out of work, all of a sudden you go, wow, I'm seeing a different side of you. How interesting when God wants to reveal himself. He didn't just want to show you a different side. He wanted to show you himself. And so he took on the form of mankind the flesh but yet he was all God and he came in this world so that you could know the very first thing that would be very intimate he's a God of kindness go with me to Romans chapter 2 verses 1 through 4 this one picks up exactly on this theme of kindness but it starts with a very troubling word when you start seeing something being repeated you're going oh God is really serious about that part, isn't he? In Romans chapter 2, verse 1, you, you notice there's a comma right there? He wants you to pause. You, so that's me, that's you. Therefore, have no excuse. Ah, there's that word once again. All right, God, you're trying, I mean, yes, we saw it in, in chapter 1 of this book that there's, there's, we're without excuse. Now you're saying we have no excuse. Do you think 
as our heavenly father, he said, you know what? For my kids, they need to hear the same message over and over because people are going to say, I, you know, when you talk with your friends, I know when I talk to some of my friends that don't have a relationship with God, what do they usually give you? Their excuse. It's the church. It doesn't say that the church can be an excuse for you not to have a relationship with God. Well, it's my friend who says he's a Christian, and, and, and it's, you know, I prayed to God, and he just didn't answer the way, oh, so you want the all-knowing God to answer the way a finite, understanding person that is limited in his knowledge or her knowledge to say, God, if you answer this way, then I will know you are real. And he says, you want to know me through me being a vending machine? That if you put the right things in, I, I give something out. I want you to know me through my kindness. And that's what the subject is in this passage. You, therefore, have no excuse. You who pass judgment on someone else, for whatever point you judge the other, you're condemning yourself. Because you who pass judgment do the same things. Oh my goodness, it just put all of mankind in the same boat, didn't it? Verse 2. Now, we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. He's revealing his judgment is just because it's based on truth. We're getting to know something about God, aren't we, right here? The things that he said boast about these things. Verse 3. So when you, a mere man or woman, that's actually mankind again, ladies, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? And actually that word is again attached to the word of truth. Will you escape God's truth? Now watch verse 4. Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness? Not realizing that God's kindness leads you towards repentance. Out of all the things that God could say, you could boast about knowing me in this area, and he picks that I exercise kindness, and now Paul gives us the insight, why is knowing this about God so important? Because this kindness leads us to what? Repentance. What's repentance mean? It means that you've done a U-turn from living this way to that way, but the basis of the word actually means this. I've changed my mind. I've changed my mind that this God is somebody out here that I can't know, that I can't have a relationship with, that I can't really understand him because he's so vast and so great. And he says, I am vast and great, but you can know me in an intimacy, and you can know through my kindness that it's worth changing your mind about having a relationship with me. That's what that passage says right there. Now, I wrote something down in this for us to catch this because I haven't focused on this part of it, and I don't know that I am, but I felt like it came to me, so I put it down. If you show contempt for God's kindness, you've brought judgment upon yourself. Isn't it interesting? Where did judgment come? It came from ourselves because we show contempt according to verse 4 there if you show contempt towards his kindness you've brought the judgment upon yourself what do we do with all that well we continue to unfold he wants to reveal himself and it says that he sends his son so that we could believe in him and that by believing in him we could know about his kindness his justice that it's based on truth and that we could have this right standing we could be in a relationship where we can be at peace with our God this story plays out all throughout the Bible and I had to choose what out of all the next things if in, in the next five minutes what could I give you that that allows you to know God in this intimate intimate way that he's kind he's just and he brings about right living righteousness in your life. And I, I was directed to so many different places, but out of this week as I scan across the scriptures and go, if they want to be here for two hours, we'll go through every one of the scriptures that point out these things because this is a common thread that connects the dots all the way from Genesis. When God comes in the garden, he says, Adam, Eve, 
where are you? And they're over hiding behind the bush because they have separated themselves from the relationship by not believing truth, what God said, but by believing what the serpent said. So they're now hiding, and he says to him, remember, the all-knowing God, did you uh, eat of that fruit of that tree? Now, that, that bothered me for years. God, you're the all-knowing God. Why would you ask if they, of course they ate. They're over behind the bush. They're separated from you. God doesn't ask us questions many times because he doesn't know the answer. As a parent, haven't you asked your kids questions and you already knew the answer? But you wanted your child to know what caused this separation. Wow. Isn't it amazing the, the relational aspect? That's all the way from Genesis, and it goes all the way through the Old Testament, through the New Testament, and I, I settled on this one part that taught about this relationship of kindness that reveals salvation. For don't you know that it's the kindness of the Lord that will make us change our mind that we want to have a personal relationship that's salvation with God through Christ Jesus? And so I came to a tiny book that's tucked away that I felt like spelled it out clearer than if you wanted to tell your friends, how, how do you know this God is a God that's a kind God? This book spells it out clearer than all the other different ways that we could go this morning. They're all great. I, I could spend a year in this area. I would love to spend a year in this area. Some of you would say he doesn't know anything else but this area. But if it says this is how you know God, couldn't you spend the rest of your life learning about his kindness, his justice, which is represented as truth, and being in a right standing with him? Wow. Good stuff, isn't it? Well, Titus is the little book, if you've been wondering what book it is. Titus chapter 3. In Titus chapter 3, this is Paul writing to a young pastor. We pick it up in verse 3. Hmm. At one time, we too were foolish. Did that just describe everybody in the world? All right. Disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. Amazing. We're, it's... The world out there groping, passions, pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But that's, that's our state because we separated ourselves from God. But when the kindness, there's the word, when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us. Not because of righteous things we have done. Remember, righteousness, right, they are doing the right things being God. Not because we could do anything that could be right enough, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Oh, I can't wait to get to the Holy Spirit next week. As a matter of fact, we are and the try God next week on the Holy Spirit. But we're going to start a journey of eight weeks of things of the Spirit after that that I'm calling Fruitalicious. Yeah, Fruitalicious. And I need some of your help out there in the future that you're going to make some of your best fruit drinks and bring your best fruit stuff. We're going to have a series called Fruitalicious. And it's all about this person of the trinity he's still god this holy spirit that the renewal the rebirth by the holy spirit whom he poured out on us generously through who jesus christ our savior so that having been justified what jesus did says to the father truth is there we've been justified by his grace this is the first time you're being introduced to this word. This represents the deepest of the deep of his kindness. Grace is the definition of his kindness. Justified by his grace that we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. Ah, ah. 
People don't talk like that anymore. I don't know why, but it's powerful. The definition of his kindness is spelled out in this word grace. Unmerited favor. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. I couldn't do anything to get it. It's a gift. Grace. Well, here's the one thing that I want you to catch from this. He exercises his kindness, not because of what I've done, but because of who he is. Not because of what I've done, but because of who he is. Boast about this, that you can understand and know God, that he exercises. It means he just doesn't know about kindness. This is his workout every day. He shows up in the world gym every day exercising kindness that is this element of grace. I don't know about you, but I don't go to the gym every day. As a matter of fact, I don't go to the gym that often. And it probably shows. But our God comes to the world gym to exercise his kindness and his grace every day. He doesn't take a day off. He's exercising his kindness every day. Now, the chapter before this, in Titus 2, tells us some of the powerful things of this kindness revealed as grace. These are the things we're to know about God, the very first thing he wanted us to know. Look at chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, which is mankind. Now watch what the very next verse. It's the key verse of this whole thought in here. It. What's it? Grace. That's what it is. It teaches, grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passion. To live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in heaven. No, in this present age. All right. As we unfold this, I got four things that I, I need you to know from this part of it. If you're going to know God in, in this intimacy, you'll know him through his kindness. And his kindness is then the definition of grace. And he says, my grace is going to teach you. Now, we thought we beat them up with a stick. Don't do these things or God's going to send you to a, the naughty place. Santa knows about the naughty list. And God knows about the naughty place. So we serve God out of fear of the naughty place. And that's not how he wanted you to know him. That's not who he is. He says, you can boast about this, that I exercise this kindness as grace, and grace will teach you something. Grace will teach you to say no to all these things out here, to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. Here's how it works out in my life. Let me give it to you in a practical way. Temptation is real for all people. Temptation is going to come whether you want it to come or not. Temptation is so real and so powerful that it believed it could even come to Jesus himself while he was here on earth, while he was in the wilderness for the 40 days. As he's out there in the desert, temptation comes to him. And God's saying this, that if you remember the intimacy about me and how kind I am and how forgiving... You're not going to say, well, I can do that because he will forgive me. You'll say, he loves me so much that he's already prepared a way out. That Why would I do that to someone who cares about me in such a way that he would give his son to pay my price? And if we followed it through in Hebrews, it says, if you have this precious gift of grace and you go well he has to forgive me out here when I ask so I go do it he says realize grace is there it'll forgive you but during this time you're re-crucifying my son you are once again dipping into the blood that had to be shed you're bringing it all back that the father has to say, my son did pay that price. Grace is not cheap. It costs God everything. 
four things that I want you to know about grace. Grace isn't just for gaining heaven and salvation. Grace is the power to say no to worldly passion. It's this intimacy that would I want to violate that relationship for a moment, fling? You that are married, you know temptation can come, but would you give up this intimacy and the trust and the bond and all the rest so that you could fulfill a momentary desire and deal with the ramifications of what that did to your spouse for the rest of their life. See, God puts this knowing him in the same relationship. It's a relationship that's as intimate as one of marriage. That's why Jesus says he is the bridegroom and he's coming for the bride. And he says, this gift that I give you that you know my kindness, you won't abuse it. You won't misuse it. You'll allow it, the grace, unmerited favor, unmerited love, unmerited forgiveness, unmerited potential of your relationship with God. You'll let it govern your heart because you're in such an intimate relationship with me and you understand my kindness so much and you know that my justice, the truth will be there that you rejected me to take this. Redoing the sin of the garden all over. I'm rejecting God's truth to take this. And he says, no, my kindness in advance will change your mind about that. That's what repentance is. My kindness, because you know me now, you know what I've already done in your life, my kindness will change your mind about that temptation. You go, Psh. it fooled me too many times before I know it leaves me wanting, it leaves me upset, it leaves me sick to my stomach, it leaves me with the, the feel of the dirt of the world of my sin all over my soul again. Why would I exchange this kindness? Let the grace of God teach me to say no to my worldly passions. Amen? So the second thing about grace is this introduces you to another whole aspect that will come through his spirit, holiness. Grace teaches me holiness. Grace teaches me that I can be separated from the things of this world. Now, it doesn't mean you're separated from the world. You will still be a person living in this world. But you'll be in a relationship that in the midst of it all, people go, there's something different about you. What is it? You've received the grace. You're not condemning to other people. You act like God. You show kindness. And you show the love of God because you've experienced it. Grace will teach you about holiness and, and more about that next week. Here's, the, here's a part of it. I, I, I wondered about throwing this in, but I, I threw it in. I'll just say it. Right conduct is based on right doctrine. Now, you probably haven't heard that word in church for a long, long time, or might, maybe you don't even know what it is. The doctrines are the truths of God that are essential. And so your right conduct is based on that you understand right truth. Truth does exist, and there's lies about the truth everywhere. You've got to come to the source of truth. How interesting that Jesus says, I came into the world, and they will know me as I am the way, I am the truth. He's the embodiment of truth, and I am the life. But that's not where that verse ends. He says, and I've come to do this so that you would know the way, and you'd know the truth, and you'd know the life, because no one can come to the Father unless they come through me. So he's the way to the Father. He's the truth about the Father. He's the life about life itself. So, right conduct is because of right doctrine. Most people, when they fudge on their relationship with God, it's because they don't want God to be God. That's a doctrine. God's deity. As a matter of fact, here, I'll give it to you real quick. You want to know what doctrine is? What are the essentials? Most people in the churches don't know. What are the essentials that are in the Bible that these are things you must know how God feels and what he says about this? Write out the word doctrine. Doctrines, because there's more than one. The D stands for deity. He is the only deity. 
The O stands for, I'm going to do this fast, but it's going to be on the website, and all of you will have to go on there to get it. The O stands for original sin. The C stands for the canon, that you know it's from God's word that it's safe. Why? Because it took 40 authors and thousands of years for this book to come together. If you have any other book that was written by one author, let's throw some out. Muhammad was one author. He, he was in a cave by himself, and it was only written by him. It didn't pass canonicity. The Bible, thousands of years, 40 authors over a thousand years, and from the beginning it starts with the, the marriage ceremony, and it's going to end with the marriage ceremony. I mean, all the dots are connected, isn't it? It's exciting. So the C stands for canning. It's God's word. If it's not in God's word, you know, you can put it sometimes in historical things, but I wouldn't put a lot of trust in it. The T stands for what we're teaching on in this series, the Trinity. The R stands for the essential doctrine of the resurrection. The power of resurrected life. The I stands for the incarnation. That's what we're dealing with today. God became flesh, the incarnated God-man. The N stands for new life. You don't stay the same person. You allow this Christ inside of you, and he will make you a new person. All things will be changed, and you'll be new. The E stands for end times, or if you want to spell out the long word, eschatology. Basically says, he's coming again. There's a lot of other different ways, but it's a doctrine that is the essentials. The S stands for the spirit and sacraments. These are the essentials of the Christian faith. There are a lot of other things out there, but they're not the essentials of the belief. And within this, you will see that the attack, when I say right conduct is based on right doctrine, we are talking today about the essence that God said, you can know me, not just about me. I don't want you to just have your head filled with information. You can know how my heart aches for this world, that I'm a God that I exercise. I'll come to the world, Jim, every day and show you that I love you through my grace and my kindness. I'm here to be with you. I want you to know. You may say, I don't know. How can all these things happen? I am a just God. Follow me. You'll find truth. And you may not know all the answers till you get to heaven. But trust me in this. I have it all worked out because I'm God. You can't work it all out because you're a human. I'm your creator. The last and final thing about grace. Because I am, this, I am in this transforming relationship, I live different. What that means is, even how I lived yesterday, I will not be that same man or woman today. I am in a transforming, you notice it's an I-N-G word, it's an ongoing relationship. I will not know this triune God fully, ever. He is all-knowing, all-present, all-powerful, even in eternity, what will make this relationship, I will be learning new things about God for all eternity. That's how vast our God is. And I'm in a transforming relationship. Who I am, who I was as the pastor here last week, isn't the pastor who I am this week. Am I still a flawed person? Obviously. But he's not done working on me. He's got all eternity. We're going to hang out together forever and ever. Because I accepted what he has done for me. Have you accepted what he's done for you?